Not bad, huh? It is a defining moment that I believe we're in right now in so many ways, whether you realize it or not. We are going to be in the book of Daniel the next couple of months. And as we're there, you're gonna recognize that there's a God who is sovereign and in control. There are characters like Daniel and his buddies, his boys, that stand up in cultural chaos. I don't know about you, but I look around and it feels like we're living in a time of real chaos. And it's an important reminder to know that whatever your chaos is, whatever you are concerned about in your own life or see in the life of the world around you, there is a God who brings order to chaos. There is a God who says, I am bigger, I am higher, I am greater. And when you trust me and follow me, my grace will be there to walk you through that chaos. I saw this screenshot on social media recently, and I'm like, yeah, that just about describes it. Go ahead and put that Christmas tree up, because nothing makes sense anyways, right? I mean, why not? Do you, I mean, do you feel that way at any level where it's like, yeah, we could expect anything to happen right now? Whether it's political pundits, social commentators, nobody knows what to expect, and that is a perfect place for a follower of Jesus to be to be reminded of who we are in him, what he has for us and what he wants to do. And so in that space, we're gonna dig deep. We are gonna dig deep in the next couple of months as we walk through this together. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to the book of Daniel. It's about halfway, a little past halfway through your Bible if you're not familiar with it. Incredible book. If you don't have one underneath you in the chairs, you'll find a Bible, you can take it. It's a gift uh, from us. You know, as we lean into Daniel, the question that we're going to have to ask ourselves and that we can almost see how he's answering the question in this first chapter that we're going to look at today is this question of who am I? And and this is an important question for all of us, right? Who am I? When the world is trying to uh, rename and claim things about our identities, when, when we live in a time where uh, we even have seen that politicians are struggling to define what a woman is, we have some identity confusion. And this idea of who am I is critical because as a Christ follower, he gives us a very clear identity. But then there's also the flip side of that question which is not about us, but God's saying, who am I? Who am I in your life? Who am I in the course of history? Who am I in scriptures? Because if you know who you are and you know who he is, God's gonna get you through it and be all right. I can remember when uh, as a 18 year old, I arrived at uh, Western Michigan University, a public university. Uh, I had seeds that had been planted in my life of faith, uh, had committed my life to the Lord, but wasn't following Jesus. And those first couple of months of that experience was swimming in the streams and, and, and realities of chaos. And, and I mean, this is a, a number of years ago, right? And uh, you don't have to amen that. Um, but I can remember just looking around me and, and seeing things I had heard about and read about and seen in movies and, and all of this stuff is happening. And in the middle of it, I'm going through a crisis. After a couple of months of, of watching all the chaos and the confusion, I literally got to a place of darkness where I, I was contemplating taking my own life And it was in that place that God met me and reminded me who he is and who I am. And I'm telling you, when we begin to wrestle with who am I, and we begin to see as we will in the text today how Daniel did that, it is powerful what God can do. In the book of Daniel, you have uh, in the Old Testament, it, it is the most prophetic book Uh, In the New Testament, you have the book of Revelation. Daniel sets the tone and stage for so many things. It's divided in kind of two halves. The first half of the book is historical and describing what was happening then. It it describes moments that that some of us remember from Sunday school, Daniel in the lion's den and, and, and the fiery furnace and all of these. And then the second half of the book is prophetic vision about what will happen. 
Now, there's two main themes in the book. One is God's sovereignty, which is a simple or a a theological way of saying God is in control. That's a great reminder, right? That God is in control. The second big theme in the book of Daniel is that God is gracious towards his people. That actually throughout all that they would face in exile and all of the challenges and chaos and things that were there, God is not just in control, but he's gracious and meets his people. When we begin to to realize that and embrace it, it, it gives hope, it gives peace even. Now, with this book, you need to know that it is so prophetic that written in the uh, 6th century BC, that actually historical revisionists later, because so many predictions in the book of Daniel were accurate, so many empires that were named and rose and fall, so many nations that collapsed or, or rose in time that literally historical revisionists tried to redate the book in the 18th century, they tried to redate uh, re- it to the Maccabean period. What does that mean? That there is so much truth that people that don't believe that God is in control and predict it wanted to rewrite when this was written. This is an important book. And as we get started in, it, in Daniel, we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. I'm going to walk through this, so stay with me. We'll kind of comment on on verse after verse, because it it describes the moment and why it's so important. The book of Jeremiah, in chapter 29, it was predicted that the people would be carried into exile in Babylon. This is now when it's happening. There will be three sieges over a 70-year period that keep people, God's people in cultural captivity and in exile. Some of us may feel like we're in exile and captive right now. And if you read verse 2, listen to how this played out. It says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, And place the vessels and the treasury of his God. Notice that this is not the God, it's a false God. And there's three things that the Jewish people in that day would have been uh, afraid of, right? One would have been this idea of deportation or exile. The other would have been of degradation or shame. That their God, their temple would be defiled. And the third was... Uh, Just this reality of a God who uh, was uh, on paper defeated. So you have defeat and shame and exile. And, And you can imagine what that would have made them feel like. And some of us maybe are wrestling with this cultural moment. And feeling like there's defeat in front of us. Or maybe some level of shame. Or we're feeling an exile and captivity. To a government, to a political system to a culture that does not seem to honor and fear God anymore. Anybody with me or am I the only one living in America right now? And so this is what they're dealing with. This is what they're walking through. I, I kind of hope you can see how relevant this is to our moment in time and why we're here over the next couple of months. Now as it goes on in verse 3, it says, then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, uh, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So... Uh, In that day and age, part of what would happen in the Persian Empire is they would choose the best and the brightest. They would choose the youth. Typically around ages 14 through 17, there would be three three years of education, of indoctrination, of, of becoming a part of their national identity and their culture. And so when it says that this is their practice and what they did, most scholars believe that that then dates Daniel and his friends that we'll read about in a minute around the age of 14. 
and that they actually would have stood out among their peers as the bright best and the brightest. And so they're chosen for that reason because the worldly side sees their potential and thinks, okay, we're gonna bring them in. We're gonna indoctrinate them and, and shape their identity to now not just be Israel, people of, of the Jewish nation, but to be Babylonian. The thought, rather than to kill them or to enslave them, was to, if we can get the best and brightest on board, maybe they'll turn the rest of the country towards us. Are you tracking with me? Education matters significantly. And, and we have to be aware, whether we're a parent or a student, of, of the, what we're swimming in with education. One of the things that we did about a little over a year ago is we started a school of leadership. And that school of leadership is designed to help position people, not just for ministry, but also to say, hey, there are folks out there doing incredible things in Christian education. We partnered with Indiana Wesleyan University. And in doing that, I want to share with you that we actually now are, are kind of letting you know, hey, if you've thought about further education, you know, maybe you're, you're out of that 14 to 17 age span and you'd like an associate's, a bachelor's, or a master's. There are options available to you, heavily discounted. We'll put up this slide here for our Bridge Initiative. This is a program that we've partnered with that's available to all of you if Pathway is your home. And you'd go, well, I don't want to be a pastor. Perfect. You're probably not called to be one then. You might be called to be a nurse, a teacher, an engineer. You might be in a job where they're saying, hey, if you'll advance your education, we can raise your salary. There are over 40 online degrees available through this program. Some are in ministry, most are not. And so we want you to know that this is available and to get more information if you'd like that. Now, as they're chosen and set aside and the, the process begins back to the text in Daniel, in verse uh, six, it says this, verse five, I'm sorry. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years and at the end of the time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, the tribe of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Now, if you're taking notes here, first thing I want to point out is when God is first, you will know who you are no matter where you are. Let me repeat this. When God is first, you will know who you are no matter where you are. Daniel and his three boys, his friends, are now in Babylonian captivity. They are in exile. And, and maybe like me going to a public university early on, you had some confusion. Some of you right now are going, okay, does God see me? Does he know who I am? And I'm saying if you answer the question solidly who God is and who you are with God, no matter where you are, you're gonna know who you are and what you're to do in a world that's trying to confuse our identities right now. That is really good news. And you might go, well, okay, tell me more. Like, why were they renamed? Why did that happen? I love how pastor and author Chris Hodges says this. He says, the names you allow to label you often title the scripts you live by. Maybe at some level, you've allowed yourself to be called a name or, or you've got a name in your head that you just keep repeating. I'm a, a liar, a loser, a failure. I'm this, I'm that. I, I don't know what the names are, but I know that what we allow ourselves to be called and titled by matters. And Daniel and his friends were renamed strategically. Let me show you this. The renaming of Daniel and the boys, this is unbelievable when you understand what these names meant. So Daniel, his name means God is my judge. His new name, Belshazzar, means lady, protect the king. It actually was a renaming to emasculate him. Names matter. The second name, 
Hananiah means Yahweh has been gracious. Meaning my God, Yahweh, the holiest name for God has been gracious. And now Shadrach, it means I'm fearful of God. Michelle means who can compare to my God? No one. It's a a name that evokes reverence and worship and awe for who God is. And now Meshach means I'm despised, contemptible, and humiliated. And then the last one, Azariah, means Yahweh has helped. Now that becomes Abednego, the servant of Nebo, which means a slave to man. Y'all, do you see how, how that moment of renaming was so significant? And I grew up in Sunday school, and, 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 and right, we were taught Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego because those names are easier to remember and sound cool. Anybody? Some of you taught Sunday school and you're like, oh man, did I mess up a generation? No, we didn't know, right? I, I can remember about 10, 10 years ago when I'm studying and I find this and I go, oh my goodness, how significant is the name? And so in that, there's this renaming that they're doing, this re-education. I mean, again, there's an enemy that wants to rename you and I, who wants to claim your identity and tame you because the God of the universe has put his spirit in you if you're a Christ follower. And the enemy would love nothing more than to rename you and tame you and claim that and say, no, no, simmer down now. Don't stand up, don't rise in this culture, cultural chaos. My hope is that throughout this series and, and even this morning, that you begin to go, wait, no, who am I and who is my God? Because he wants to do something in and through every life present. And here's where we turn next in Daniel 1, verse 8. We'll see how it begins to play out. But Daniel resolved, can you say resolved? That he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs, to allow him to not defile himself. So if you remember a few verses earlier, it said they're gonna give them not just a new name and new education, but we're gonna give them of the king's table of food. We wanna, we wanna make sure that they eat our food and they're fattened and healthy and, and it's a sign both of, of royalty and prosperity, but also most scholars believe that because this is in Babylon and, and food was used in worship, that this was food that was actually defiled, that may have been sacrificed to false gods. That this was food that not only was it about the nutrients, but it was also about the fact that it was used in wicked pagan worship. And here's Daniel saying, I'm resolved. The Hebrew word used there means uh, to make up or set. It means to fix or determine something in such a way that you're gonna hold to it, surely. It's interesting how it's moments like that of having resolve and conviction, knowing our identity that gives us clarity in action. The Christian's purpose, if you're taking notes, is their identity in action. You see, we often get this backwards, right? We, we begin to think, okay, I, it's my behavior, it's what I do, and that, that shows people my identity. And at some level, that does show others. But our identity as a Christ follower is meant to flow out, our, our, our purpose is meant to flow out of that identity. Our actions are defined by our identity in Christ. Not to pick on the author or, or the book, But to just mention that years ago, a book was written called The Purpose Driven Life. It's one of the best sellers, Uh, amazing, right? Over 22 million copies sold of this book. I've read it, I've seen the impact in my life and the life of others. Do you know what I found myself thinking this week? Is why did that sell so many copies? If I read my Bible and it says, 
My identity informs my purpose in action. Why is there so much disconnect and confusion? And I think at some level it's because we have to get back to the word of God. We've got to get back to who he is and our identity in him. And when we begin to do that, we don't need another book. That can be a great supplement. But when his word, and, and, and you need to know part of why like Daniel knew his identity, he was about, we think, 14. In his childhood, there was a king who led a revival of God's word. That actually God's word in his early childhood had been refound and begun to renew the people of God. Daniel, at 14, knew the word and knew his identity in a way that allowed him to have a purpose and to put it into action to say, I'm resolved, I do not want to defile myself. So throughout this series, I think there's going to be defining moments, moments of decision. And we want to put up this link for you just as a reminder whether you're deciding in the midst of everything to follow Jesus, to recommit to Jesus, maybe you're deciding that you need to be baptized, or, or maybe you're deciding, I've got a story, and I need to share it because that's going to help and free other people. We want to encourage you to, to stand up and to say, I want to put my identity, and I want to I put my purpose into action. And to make those kind of decisions, these defining moments like Daniel did, can I get an amen? amen? Now with that, from that moment, we're gonna unpack five questions that I believe are gonna help us navigate cultural chaos. There's five action steps, five things that Daniel does that I think can, can inspire us, inform us, and, and honestly equip us for what God wants to do. Because I can't just leave you in a moment where you're fired up, right? I gotta, I gotta make sure you got the tools. And I love the practicality and application of God's word because Daniel does it. We'll pick up here in verse uh, nine. It says, and God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who were of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. The first question is what we see, and I just spoke to a minute ago, is will you stand up with conviction? Daniel stands up with conviction and, and speaks to this person. He's a young man, and, and, and I don't see a lot of, I see a number of teenagers in here, but the majority of us are not in our teen years. So, so may we not be lost on the fact that there is something God will do in every generation. And I don't care how old you are, God wants you and I to stand up with conviction. And that might mean that there are compromises that the world is throwing at us right now that God's going to say, no, 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 no. I need you to stand up with conviction and stop compromising. This could be in your school, students. This could be in your workplace. I mean, how many of us have been in a situation where a boss asks us to cut a corner, to do something that we know is unethical or illegal, because that's just how we do things here, and no, everybody does it, and we won't get caught. I'm telling you, these are defining moments. Moments where our conviction of who God is and who he wants to be in and through us, like Daniel, should be greater. He was risking his life, and he was risking the life of that man who he asked. It's interesting, when we don't have conviction, it doesn't take much to get off track. We actually uh, have a number uh, of pilots from Skyborne that have, uh, in the last couple of months, a uh, local uh, pilot school that have started attending the church. We're so glad they're here and uh, excited about what God's doing in their lives. And, and they can correct me on this, but my understanding is there's a, a one degree rule uh, that for every degree that you move the nose of a plane, that, that it actually affects about 60 miles one way or the other. 
that, that actually one degree can get you 60 miles. I got a pilot sitting here. Am I, is that a, a rule? Maybe. He's shaking his head. Yes, come on. Let's go. Okay, so one degree, 60 miles, right? In 1979, there was a New Zealand airplane that was giving tours over Antarctica. And this airplane lost 237 people and 20 crew members on the side of a mountain because they didn't know that their navigation system was essentially set two degrees off as the flight began. And because of cloud cover and other things, when they decided to descend to an altitude that would have made sense, two degrees to the left or right, whichever it might have been, they thought they were good. And tragically, all those lives were lost. I just wonder if some of us need to look and go, I'm, I'm one degree off right now. How would God have me, with conviction, get back on track before lives are lost? Uh, Today, our governor here in Florida has declared this Protection of Life Sunday. And we as a church believe in life from the womb to the tomb. And this past week, we had an event, uh, you know, not a political or partisan event, but really what I believe is a theological and legal issue. And it's this idea of voting no on Amendment 4. This is an important moment. Because even for those who may disagree uh, on the issue of pro-life or pro-choice, the law and the amendment goes way too far. There's misinformation out there. People need the real information. It was a great event on Thursday. I just want to encourage you, we're, we're standing up with conviction right now. There's information at the Welcome Center. You can email us, happy emails, negative emails. I don't care, we'll embrace all of it. If we can get the conversation going, about what this is. If you want yard signs, we have some today as well at our Welcome Center. It's an important moment. Now, as we stand up with conviction, the second thing Daniel does is so critical to go with this. Let me show you in verse 11. In verse 11, it says, Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, notice that's their real Hebrew names, okay? It's in that moment that he stands up with graciousness. So will you, second question, stand up with graciousness? You don't get an excuse in your conviction to be a bully or a jerk. Can I just say it that bluntly? That that Jesus says that we're to be full of grace and truth, that we're to love others and to be known by our love. So, So part of what he does here is he stands up with a graciousness because he realizes I'm in captivity and I need to submit to authority as far as I'm able and be gracious to these people. But I also will not bend the knee to Babylon to defile my God or what I believe in. So this issue of graciousness is significant Because whether it's Amendment 4 or some other issue that you need to stand up for, the question becomes, will we do it with graciousness in a way that invites others to see the grace of our God? Because throughout the book of Daniel, again, it's that reminder, two main themes. He's sovereign and in control, and he's gracious towards his people. So we, as well, are to be gracious to the world around us, even as we stand in our convictions. And Daniel did this brilliantly. Verses 13 through 16 lead to our third question. It says, then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. So he he proposes a test. He says, hey, uh, this is my conviction. I'm asking for your permission. He does it graciously. And then he begins to say, here's the test, and I'm going to trust by faith what I think God will do. He says, who eat the king's food, be observed by you, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this manner and tested them for 10 days. Now, the number 10, there's many times in uh, numerology and symbolism in the Bible, uh, 10 actually often stands for testimony. It's interesting that these 10 days would be a testimony that we're talking about thousands of years later. Amen? So he says, for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance 
and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. Now, I'm gonna just tell you, I am not vegan. I am a straight carnivore. So this had to be supernatural. Do you see it? So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And all the vegans said, amen. (laughs) The question here, the third question is, will you stand up with faith? My wife coined a word that we've used around here, Godfidence. There's a confidence in God, a Godfidence, this, this sense of faith that we're to have, that, that we will say, okay, I trust my God, and I believe he'll, in this test, provide a testimony. And I don't know what that is in your life. I don't know if God's saying, hey, I need you to stand up with conviction and graciousness by faith on this issue or this area. I, I don't know what it is, but I'm telling you, that if we do it by faith, and that's the key. In the, old, in the New Testament, it actually talks about anything done apart from faith is a sin. So we're not asking you to do things that God isn't revealing and leading you to do. Did, did you sense the freedom in that? that? That actually you and I are supposed to be listening to God, listening to what he has for our lives, and then by faith being obedient to that. When we're obedient to that, God will show up and give us a testimony in the middle of it. And and let me just give you a little spoiler here of what's coming. They're going to be tested in a fiery furnace. They're going to be tested in a lion's den. This is just over food in the beginning. And, And that's the beauty of how God works is when by faith we're obedient In what seems like little things, he can trust us with even bigger things. Some of you have been cutting corners. Some of you have been disobeying God in little things that you think don't matter. And yet you know that God has said, I need you to obey me. And I'm just here to tell you that if you will find the freedom and the faith to obey him in that, he's going to lead you in ways that will increasingly allow more of what he has into your life. But we gotta start by faith with the things he's shown us today. Come on, church. So he has a great faith. So the first question is, will you stand up, right, with conviction? Will you stand up with graciousness? Will you stand up then with faith? And then we get to the fourth question. In verse 17 through 20, it says, As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill and all literature and wisdom. Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chiefs of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none, can you say none? None was found. Like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. They stood before the king because none was found like them. They were doing it with excellence and they got elevated. Do you see it? It says, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times, there's that 10 again, better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. 10 times better 10 times more excellent. That's the question, right? The fourth question is, will you stand up with excellence? You see, Daniel, in verse 21, we learn, was actually not just in the first wave of people carried into exile. He would be there in the end. That for 70 years, Daniel would be in this situation held captive. Now, I'm going to be the first to tell you, that's probably the verse in this passage that has bothered me the most lately. Because I don't like to wait. Do you? But, but here, some of you are like, oh, is he serious? Because, no, I, I don't even wait for the microwave most days, right? That's, that's my issue. I did it yesterday. Every time I used the microwave yesterday, I actually stopped it before it dinged. It's true. I've confessed this before. You're not surprised. 
But, but here's the thing, even in the patience, even in the long suffering, Daniel did it with excellence. And again, you might be like, well, my boss is wicked, this culture is wicked. Don't serve them, serve him. Don't serve them, serve God. Colossians 3, 17, whatever I do, I do it for the Lord and not for man. Daniel and his friends demonstrated a level of excellence. I'm just telling you, Christians, if we would apply this as part of our identity and our purpose in action, we should be the best employees. They should be lining up at the church doors to say, we gotta hire people, who do you have? But you and I know that often Christians are lazy and slothful and we don't perform in the same way that even the world does. So I'm telling you, with all the love I can, we've got to stand up in this cultural chaos and part of how we'll stand up and stand out is doing it with excellence. That's what gave favor to Daniel and his friends. Now the very last question, will you stand up with others? Uh, this one, you, you can't miss. There's an old poem, it's famous, it's awesome, I love it, except for one aspect. The, the poem is called Dare to Be a Daniel. That was an original theme I had for this particular message, and then I re realized, wait, that's very individualistic. Daniel was never alone. Daniel was never alone. God was with him, and for most of the book of Daniel, the three boys were with him. You see, if you think that you're gonna stand up to cultural chaos on your own, you're dead in the water. I'm just telling you, I love you enough to tell you that, that actually it's only with the help of God and the help of others. And we celebrated earlier in the service the fact that more than 550 people were here on Wednesday, men, women, youth, and children. It was incredible. Why are you not a part of it? Why, and maybe you'd go, okay, I can't do it on Wednesdays. No problem. We have 17 other groups right now that are meeting. That's not even included in those numbers. So what am I saying? The gift and invitation of God is to realize that we are gonna stand up with others, not alone. That's the brilliance of what we see with Daniel and these friends. When I was a kid, I got a chance to learn how to ride horses. I loved it and enjoyed it. And it's interesting if you know anything about horses. A, a draft horse, uh, on average, can, can haul about 8,000 pounds on its own. That draft horse paired with another horse, you'd go, okay, mathematically, that would be 16,000, but actually it's exponential. It's 24,000 pounds. And then if those two stay together and they're trained together to pull together, those two actually can pull 32,000 pounds, four times the amount they could do on their own. Do you see the correlation? There's brilliance in the body of Christ and what Jesus has invited us into. So the five questions, will you stand up with conviction, with graciousness, with faith, with excellence, and then with others? Will you? Because that will help us stand up in cultural chaos. And this idea of invitation to others, this is at the core of our faith, and we need to remember that. At least once a month around here, we remember what Jesus did for us through the act of communion. And I wanna remind you that as we receive communion, we're remembering who Jesus is, how he stood up for us, and how he invites us to be his people in the middle of cultural chaos. And that he says, listen, as you do this, you're not doing this alone, you're remembering me and the fact that I've placed you in the body of Christ with new brothers and sisters. Look around you for a minute. You got some family in the room. You are not alone. And you're like, well, they don't look like me. They don't act like me. They don't smell like me. They came in wet today because it's raining. And God's like, but do you see my spirit in them? Do you see that they're created in the image of God just like you are? So as we receive communion today, it is countercultural. It is designed to cause us to remember who our God is, who we are, 
and who we get to do this with. So in Matthew 26, verse 26 through 29, Jesus, as he instituted what we know as communion or the Lord's Supper, he said, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. As we receive communion today, the elements are up front. I'll give you instructions in a minute. I just wanna invite you to reflect, to remember. Maybe this cultural moment, this chaos has pulled you a little bit sideways or a little bit backwards or discouraged you. It's moments like these in the remembering of who I am, of who he is, of who I get to do this with. That he says, hey, I wanna renew you. I wanna refresh you. If you're a believer in Jesus, believe even the fact that Daniel set aside other food to focus on the food that God had for him, which Jesus laid out for us, the bread and the juice. It's a great reminder of what it means to put him first. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we would invite you, come to our sides, come talk to anybody for prayer before you receive communion. We would love to pray with you that you could receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Enter into that relationship and then receive communion with us as a believer, as a brother or sister in Christ. So I'm gonna pray over us and then I'll give us instructions. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for just what we can learn in a day like today, in a moment like now, of how faithful and good you are, that you are in control and that you are gracious towards your people. You did it for Daniel and and the boys. You've done it for us through your son Jesus now. And so Father, as we prepare to receive communion today, the bread and the juice, we thank you for your body. We thank you for your blood. We thank you that it washes over us, fills us and allows us to stand for you and live for you in this culture. So just bless this time as we interact with you. In Jesus' name, amen.